things. You know, that we do not wrestle against, you know, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers. And then he talks about bringing down every stronghold in the mind. So Paul writes in uh, Romans chapter 12, he talks about renew your mind. It is the mind where the battle takes place. Huh? Battles are won or lost in the mind. Uh, Jesus defeated the enemy on the cross. He defeated him in the tomb. Right? He defeated him and rose again from the, from the grave. But the enemy can defeat the Lord in our minds if we let him. So we've got to have absolute you know, control with the help of the Lord. Amen? That we always, you know, have to be totally convinced by our hearts we believe, with our mouth we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we must always confess that He is always on the throne, that He is working all things together for my good. Especially if you love God and you are seeking after God, you know that you love God in the best way you can. Okay? Right? When Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? His, his reply was, you know, Lord. Huh? So at the end of the day, uh, we, we may think that we do not love him like we should love him, but we know we love him, right? We know we love the Lord. And God understands us because our, uh, our relationship with him differs one from the other, but we do love God in our own way. You do not love the Lord. You cannot say, you know, I don't love God as much as that person loves God. But like I shared, you know, the, the other time that we, are, we qualify for the kingdom based upon what Jesus has done, not upon what we do. Not upon the amount of prayers we pray, not about all of that is meant to build us, not so much to build our relationship with God, because our relationship with God is never affected. God loves us all of the time. Even in our sin, God loved us. Yes or not? So the relationship that God has with us is never affected. It's just that our relationship with Him is affected. Especially when a child does something that is wrong, the child wants to hide. It's not affect the parents' love for the child. All right, the parents' love is still there, but our love for our parents begin. We begin to question ourselves: Will the parents still love me? Will the parents still care for me? All these are questions we raise in our hearts. But God has got no problems in loving us all the time. Come on, Amen. That's that's God. Okay, so now we are coming into uh, uh, the Holy Spirit. From now on, the lessons are going to be very very simple. I told my wife I said it's going to be the Holy Spirit 101, okay, which means right at the beginning, very, very simple lessons, lessons that you already know, but which I want to emphasize uh, again so that we can grasp what it means to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. I started by sharing with you that the Holy Spirit is the person that God has placed upon the earth now. He is the governor. He is meant to bring kingdom uh, culture into our place. We have been colonized by heaven. God wants to colonize this earth. He wants it to be exactly like heaven. Just like when England colonized Malaysia, they wanted it to be exactly like the British. We speak the language, we do English things, but God now wants to colonize our world, wants to colonize our home with kingdom culture. So the church has a culture itself. The culture of the church is one where there is love, where everybody will know us by our love. That's our culture where we accept one another, where we do not look beyond the color of the, uh, we look beyond the color of the skin. And so in heaven, there's going to be, you know, when people often tease one another, you know, like when I preach in a certain place and the pastor, like in India, the pastor say, Pastor, you must learn to speak Tamil because, you know, when you go to heaven, the language of heaven will be Tamil. Okay. <laughs> but when you look in the Bible, it says every kindred, every tongue, God doesn't change. He, he will allow the tongues to still remain there, all the tongues that He has given to mankind to communicate. So you will be speaking in your own language. They will be speaking in their language. The thing is, our understanding is no longer limited. So we will be able to understand each other perfectly. Okay? Because that's perfection, right? When we, when we are together. Now the thing is, what we need to understand is that the, the governor is the most important person. He's come to make sure that our culture is changed, our language is changed, our behavior is changed. Everything about us now begins to represent heaven. That's what uh, kingdom control is all about, right? He wants uh, this world to be colonized by uh, the Holy Spirit. So he is here. But tonight, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and who he is a little bit more. Now, this is the last seven hours of Jesus' life with the disciples. Not before he goes to the cross, but the last seven hours that he spends with them. Before he begins that, he tells them to go and look for a room. 
So they find a room where they're going to have the last, what we call the last supper. Okay? When they enter the room, Jesus then begins to uh, sit down with all the disciples and he starts by washing their feet. After he washes their feet, they say, oh, you know, why did you do this and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, now he starts to serve them communion. All right. After communion, this is in, and what does he do in communion? He's sharing now principles about what's going to take place. He's talking to them about John chapter 14, begins by talking about, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, you may be also. Thomas says, where are you going, Lord? And then, you know, how can we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way, John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Then he begins to talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, after this conversation goes on, he's beginning to minister a little bit about the Holy Spirit. Then in verse 31, John 14, 31, But the world must know that I love the Father, so I do exactly what the Father told me. So come, let us go. So John 14 is where he ends in the, uh, that, that room, and now they are about to go out. Right? They're about to go out. They walk through... If you've been to uh, Israel with us, you know they, from up there, they walk down the Mount of Olives through uh, olive patches, olive gardens. They walk through that and then they come to a certain spot called Gethsemane. Okay? But as they are walking and discussing, Jesus talks about in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Yeah? Okay? Everybody following with me? This is the conversation that's going on the last seven hours before he's taken up. Uh, he's caught arrested. Okay? So he's sharing this is the most important message because he's about to leave. The last words of a person before they die are the most important words. The last commands, the last teachings are the most important. So he begins to teach them concerning the Holy Spirit. Now why must we know the Holy Spirit? We must know him as a person. Because why? Why is this so important? I'll be talking about that each time. Uh, Tuesday when we come together emphasizing the, the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person why is this important anybody <laughs> because if he is not a person you cannot have a personal relationship you cannot have a relationship with an it you cannot have a personal relationship with a thing you cannot have a personal relationship with a power. You must have a relationship with a person. So to understand that the Holy Spirit, uh, so it is important for us. Uh, number one importance is we must know him as a person. So in the next few lessons, we're talking about how does this relate to you and me. Okay, so let's get into our notes. You got all notes there. My wife asked why so many pages. It's because I wrote down all the scriptures for you so that you don't have to go and write it down yourself. And we can all know what we are talking about. Now, four times Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the helper. And here are all the four verses. Now observe, all right? 14, verse 16 and 17. I will pray the Father, he will give you another. All that is highlighted, right, in your notes. That what? He may abide. With you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. The same thing, John 14. All this is in John 14, 15 and 16. Okay. Verse 14, 25, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you. All things bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. So this this is he's emphasizing the fact that the Holy Spirit is not a force. He's not a power. He is exactly like me. I will send you someone just like me. Come on, Amen. All right. Uh, he will bring all things to your remembrance. All right. Uh, the next verse. Helper when he comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father. He will testify of me. Amen. All right. He will testify of me. Now, uh, okay, John 16. I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. We all know the importance of Jesus having to go and the importance of the Holy Spirit coming, because without the Holy Spirit, we cannot be reached. 
touch Gentiles around the world because that's a prophecy of the word of God huh? that the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth the, uh, the glory of God will cover the earth and the knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea that's the that's a prophecy that's a fulfillment all right how is this going to be carried out Jesus cannot do it on his own because remember when those prophecies were given man only traveled by foot or they had a donkey they couldn't travel far all nations shall come. When we went to Israel just recently, you know, the guy who was sharing with us, he said, you know, it, it, is, it, it is, we are watching the fulfillment of prophecy because Isaiah talked about all the nations coming to worship God. I mean, every nation worships so many gods, but they are coming to worship the one true God. That itself is a tremendous prophecy and people from all over the world are coming to Israel to worship God. All Gentiles and Jews, everybody coming to Israel to worship God. That itself is a fulfillment of prophecy. Yes or not? Amen. All right. So like, we, like what we are saying tonight is the Holy Spirit has never ever been introduced as an it. And so when you read the Old King James Version, sometimes you will have the word it, which is a wrong, bad translation. He has always been introduced as someone who begins to speak to us. Here's another scripture. I think you have that. John 16. Do you have that with you? Uh, proof that he speaks. Okay. John 16 verse 12 and verse 13. I have many things to say to you. Right. So I, I've been talking to you. I've been telling you many things. But uh, you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth and he will not speak on his own behalf on his own authority but whatever he hears he will speak and he will tell you things to come amen so he will speak to us the holy spirit will speak amen and we have to listen to his voice that's why you know constantly in the book of revelation it ends by saying he who has an ear to hear let him hear what the spirit is saying he speaks he is a person a power does not speak a thing does not speak, but the Holy Spirit as a person will speak to us. Amen. Now, one of the words in your notes, I think you have the word helper there, parakletos. Do you have that there? All right, parakletos. In the English, it is paraclete or paraclete. In our own English word, we call it paraclete, but it is taken from this Greek word parakletos. Para means alongside. Okay? Alongside. Kletos means come. Kletos means to come. So what does what uh, the name of the Holy Spirit mean? What is, he, what is his responsibility? He will come alongside you to assist you to the place where you become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. That's his responsibility. He will come alongside you. He does not just give orders from a distant place. He comes alongside every person. Jesus said, that's why it is better for me to go. Because if I do not go, then he cannot come. And if he comes, he can be beside every individual. Helping every individual. Come on, amen. Parakletos. So, parakletos. Uh, uh, the word like uh, parable. Para. All right. Parable, para. Bole. The word para is what? Alongside. And bole is to throw. So Jesus throws alongside truths, throws, uh, throws stories alongside truths he wants to be shared. Okay? Parable. Parabole, which means he will throw a story while he is trying to teach a truth. Parabole. Para, graph. Para is alongside. Graph is to write. So, alongside what you want to write, you will write another thing and another thing. So, you got paragraphs. Come on, amen? So, the word, all right? That, that's for you just uh, free of charge. Uh -huh. All right. Now, uh, the name of the Holy Spirit given to the Holy Spirit. By the way, we have a problem relating to the Holy Spirit because of His name. See, it's no problem relating to God because He's the Father. No problem relating to Jesus, right? Because He's the Son. 
But Holy Spirit is different. Okay, here's the thing. His name is not the Holy Spirit. It is His function. So you have God, later we'll talk about that, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is God. Later on we talk about Him being God. All right. Uh, so he's got different names. And one of the main names in the Bible is, uh, that's given to him in the New Testament is the name Comforter. Comforter. How many of you have got comforters in your home? You know, comforters? How many of you got comforters that you got which was very nice but you never use? And you keep so that you can give it to a guest. Huh? All right? You have it, but you don't use it. Have you got things in your home which you have and you don't use? Like guest bath towels. Right? <laughs> nice, nice woolen ones. Then I begin to use it. And then she goes, hey, that one for guests, lah, not for you. <laughs> it's meant to be for guests, not for you. All right? Good cutlery sets, good plates, and, and, and what's the brand? What's, huh? Not Pyrex, the one we got from Noratike. 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 Noritake. Okay, buy that. But don't use. <laughs> Keep until special guests come on. Teacups, bone china. Don't use. Same thing with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> we have Him, but we don't allow Him to be used. We keep Him in the same way. All right? Now, the Holy Spirit in your notes, number one, is your helper. That's the first thing we need to understand. He has come to help this entire world, in general speaking, to become like heaven. But he's also our personal helper to help us to be what we ought to be, to say things that we ought to say. That's why, you know, when we pray for people, it is important before, you know, when somebody asks us for prayer, just say, Lord, please help me. Holy Spirit, just help me. And, and you'll be surprised that as you're praying, uh, words begin to come out. For example, just now when we are praying, you know, you start off in your own. It's always like that. In order to walk on water, Peter had to step out of the boat himself. He cannot expect God to just take him and throw him on top of the water. Lord, I want to walk on the water. Take me out of the boat. No, it's not. He says, no, you step out. You want to walk? He said, come. So the guy has to step out. In the same way with the Holy Spirit, we, we start praying first. Like just now, you know, we start praying. And then uh, this word came to me that uh, as the waves come and he says, thus far and no more. So pray that concerning other things in our lives. If things are beginning to affect us, so we begin to pray, God, you know, just as you stop the waves, we were talking, uh, Pastor Lifan and I talking yesterday as we were driving back. Was it last night? Eh? We were looking at the moon this morning. <laughs> this morning, beautiful moon. I do not know whether you all saw it or not. Big, beautiful moon. And then we're talking about the waters that cover the earth. All right? More water on earth than anything else. And the world is turning around, and yet the, wa the waters go up to a certain point, then it stops. We go to the beach, we see the waves come up to a certain place and stop. The Bible says, God says, thus far and no more. So the enemy comes in like a flood. God says, we have to say, thus far and no more. All right? That's as far as you go. Yes or not? So he will help us to say what we ought to say. And then sometimes the Holy Spirit will also help us not to say what we are not to say. Have you ever thought to yourself, you know, actually I shouldn't say this. Have you heard people say to you, no, actually, I shouldn't say this, huh? but uh, I just want to let you know. Lah. Then later on, they say, oh, yo, I shouldn't have said that. Huh? Huh? See, when you have this, I should not have, and you violate that. You, you know why I'm saying violate? Because we are all believers, and we all have a check in our spirit by the Holy Spirit. He is our helper. He has already come to live inside of us. We just don't know it. We don't realize that He's already staying inside of us. He's our helper. He's alongside us. He's beside us. He's all around us. He wants to help us
to be what we ought to be, to say what we ought to say. This morning, I'm sitting down with all the, uh, uh, to, with our other pastors and our workers together. We sat down, and, and I was just sharing with them, you know, about uh, speaking things. Yeah, what uh, I was sharing with them, I just slipped my mind. <laughs> Talking about, you know, le- learning to, to understand the workings of the Holy Spirit, learning to speak uh, as, as God, sorry, to declare, that's right, I was talking about learning to declare, when you speak, I said, when you are preaching, you are actually prophesying into people's lives. Peter says that, when you speak, speak as the prophet of God into people's lives. See, we are different people, we are people of the kingdom, that's why we're talking about the Holy Spirit being with us in such a powerful way, to say things that we ought to say. Amen. So the Holy Spirit is our helper, and there are three ways He he helps me. Very clearly, Jesus makes this real. John chapter 16 and verse 8. Three ways He he comes to help me, all right? Let me just read that scripture to you. When He comes, He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Right? You have that there in your notes? Okay? Now listen. Our understanding of this scripture comes from, my understanding of it, comes from the background of a Pentecostal church. All right. Now, the Pentecostals are wonderful. They led us into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But that does not mean that everything that they teach is right. So the teaching of this was, he will come and he will convict you when you sin. In other words, the teaching was, he will convict you of your sinful living. For your sinful life, okay? Then of righteousness, that you've got to be righteous before Him. And the third one is that you will be judged, that there is a judgment coming and eventually you are going to be judged. So that was the teaching. But actually, if you look at the Word of God, it begins to give us a totally different picture. So in the notes, A, the first thing He comes to convict, uh, uh, convict us of is sin. All right, now watch this. In your notes, when He... And he, when he comes, he will convict the world about the guilt of sin. Come on. Amen. And the need of a Savior about sin and the true nature of it because they do not believe me or or in my message. He's not here to convict us concerning our sinful living, although when we sin, there is a conviction that we have done wrong. But he's not going to convince us of that. He's going to convince us that we are sinners. See, unless I know and am convicted that I am a sinner, I will never seek a savior. So he comes to make me aware that I need God. Why did we ask Jesus to be our savior? Because we felt that we needed one. Even Mary, when she prayed after, you know, she says, I praise God, my savior. He is my Savior. We all needed to get saved. So there is that desire in our heart which somehow has been created by the Holy Spirit. So blessed are those who have got the desire for a Savior. That is something that you have allowed the Holy Spirit to do in your life. Is everybody following with me? So sin, the conviction of sin, is not to make me sin conscious, but to make me conscious of my need of a Savior. That's what it means. He comes to help me to understand, I have got sin in my life. I am a sinner and God, I need to be saved. And then comes, uh, you know, uh, other things that he can add to my life. So he's not here to convict me of sinful living, although that comes along the way. When I do things that are wrong, I know. And you know when you do things that are wrong. When you tell a lie, now you don't want to tell lies. How come? Because your nature has been changed. When you're dirty, you do not like to be dirty in your spiritual man. There's something inside of you that says, this is not right. That's because he has already done a work in your life. You are now, that's what we talk about, being dead in sin and being alive unto God. Come on, amen. When we were dead in sin, no matter what we did, you can kick a dead person, the dead person doesn't feel anything. So when we were dead in sin and we sinned against God in our spirit man, we didn't even care. We can curse him, we can swear. Why do people do the things that they are doing? Because they are dead to God. Huh? In their sin, they are dead in sin. So when we become alive to the Spirit of God being born again and we become alive, everything changes. We become aware that this is right, this is holy, and this is profi- uh, um, profane. This is wrong. We know. 
We don't need anybody to teach us because now the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us begins to teach us. That's what it means. You have an anointing from the Holy One, uh, 1 John chapter 2, I think, uh, and, and that anointing teaches you. You don't need any man to tell you this is right, this is wrong. You know. Yes or not? So that's why it is important to preach uh, uh, and, uh, to people to raise their level of faith, to believe in a God who actually is there to help them. Because every person knows that they have done wrong. When they do something wrong, especially if I'm talking to believers, every believer knows that when they have done wrong, they have done wrong. All right? They just are battling with these things. All right? Okay? All right. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3. Therefore, I want to impart to you an understanding of the following. No man speaking by the Spirit of God would ever say Jesus is the accursed one. And then again, no one can say Jesus is Lord unless the Spirit is speaking through him. So once we become believers, it is only the Holy Spirit that makes us say Jesus is the Savior, Jesus is my Lord. The Holy Spirit is the one. He has convicted me, brought me to a place where I can now say, Jesus, you are my Savior, you are my Lord. Come on, amen. Everybody okay with that one? All right, number two. Be in your notes. He not only convicts me of my need of a Savior, He also convicts me of righteousness, convinces me. Now, as I said before, the word convict and convince uh, are married together. They are about the same in this context. So He convinces me now that because I have received Jesus as my Savior, look at 16 verse 10, about righteousness, that righteousness comes from above. Amen. Now he's telling me, listen, you have now, uh, in your notes, huh? he comes to give us an understanding of a right standing. Now, earlier in your notes, do you have that one? The reason he convicts of sin. Do you have that one? Didn't write yet, sorry. The reason he convicts of sin is so that I will see my need of a savior. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't realize that that was underlined. You got that one? The reason he convicts of sin is not so that I will live condemned without any hope. It's so that I can see my need of a Savior. That's why he convicts me of sin. So I can get help. Remember, another, if you read another translation, I will send you another Savior, it says. Instead of the word helper, one of the translations would read, I, will, I think Passion Translation says, I will send you another Savior. Alright? This is what it means. He comes to save us. Make it real so that we can get saved. Amen. Alright? In your notes, He comes to give us an under, right understanding of a right standing before God. That now I can stand before God. I have the right to stand before Him. That's why I keep sharing with you, the, the, the Holy Spirit is the only one that says to us, listen, because He has shed His blood, you must come into His presence regularly. Therefore, by the blood of Christ, let us draw close to Him. Yeah? Without the shedding of, I mean, because He shed His blood, it would be pointless if we do not draw near to Him. Let us draw near through boldness, through the blood of the Lamb. The Holy Spirit makes this real. You've got the Savior. His blood has cleansed you. Come on into the room. So now, in your notes, because of this helper, we can now have kingdom rights. Here are the kingdom rights. Number A, uh, one in your notes. Throne room access. Throne room access. Now, you and I, because of what uh, uh, the Holy Spirit has done, He convinces me. That's why now I am bold to come in. Right? Sorry? A-C-C-E-S-S, -S. not access, E-X-C-E-S-S, -S. <laughs> access. Access. Uh, that's why I shared with you, you know, when I was uh, in Bible school and all that, and I told you about fighting in Bible school, standing there trying to praise God, and, and I had this voice inside of me saying, you are a hypocrite, because I just fought in the college, and now I'm standing there trying to worship God. Then you have another voice inside of me saying, God is greater than the condemnation of your heart. Worship Him. So what, did, what happened? The Holy Spirit spoke to let me know you have a right standing. Your, your sin does not affect, you know, what you have done does not affect your right standing with God. 
You have the right to worship him and he has the right to receive worship. Therefore, worship him. Enter into his gates with, into his courts with, I thought enter into his gates with confessing all my sin first. Is that what we do? We come, we confess, God, you know, I did all wrong things. Now, how can I come and praise him? Hey, very easy for you all to praise, but I just feel God, I sin again. Yeah. No, 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 no. Enter with thanksgiving that you have a right standing. See, the one who wrote that psalm is David, who lived under the new covenant before the new covenant was introduced. That's why David never had the Holy of Holies to go through. He had an open tent. Everybody could come in. Everybody could worship. He had a proper understanding of the heart of God. Right standing comes by justification of faith. And when did that happen? With Abraham. Abraham was justified by faith. David understood that. Not by all the things that you do. By faith. So David just took that into his heart. And we are children, you know, sons and daughters of Abraham. We, we must learn how to worship him by faith. So uh, throne room access, uh, kingdom resources availability. Kingdom resources availability. So now I can come and like I said, my bank now is in heaven. Heaven is not in a bank. Whatever happens in the economy of the country, you must know that your resources come from God. You know, and I thank God, you know, even uh, the Lord has helped me, you know, it is all by the grace of God, help me never to ask for money for myself, never. I'd rather go hungry, I'd rather go, like Paul says, uh, there were many times that he had to be hungry, not because he was fasting, but because he was forced to be hungry, no food. But he never asked for anything, why? Because once you say, God is my supply then God will supply. God will supply you with hunger. <laughs> so you learn how to be hungry. Why is it only the poor must be hungry? You must not be hungry. Learn to be hungry. Learn to go through hard times. Learn to go through sleeping on hard floors. Because there are many people who sleep on hard floors. Come on, amen. Learn to drink water and go to bed. Why? Because there are many people who drink water and go to bed. That's all they have. So all these are lessons, blessed lessons, that millionaires can't pay to get. <laughs> but we get the privilege of enjoying them. Come on. But we learn that our availability... So when things go wrong, when stock markets crash, millionaires commit suicide. Why? Because they don't know how to sleep on hard floors. They don't know how to go hungry. But when you have learned the lessons, to you, God is my source, man. He wants me to go through it. Praise God. He's got a lesson for me in this. You can work it out. The enemy can work anything they want for my bad, but God will work it out for my good. Amen. All right. My resources are kingdom resources. And then, of course, see, uh, the third one is kingdom authority. Our prayers are different. We pray prayers are different. So there's a difference between religious prayers and Holy Spirit prayers. So the Holy Spirit helps us to pray and say things that people who don't have the Holy Spirit cannot do and say. They may be religious. The people in the Bible, uh, all the, the high priests and everybody else, they had paper authority, whereas Jesus had real authority. So the people loved to hear him because he spoke as one having authority, the Bible says. How could Jesus speak? with? He didn't have paper authority, but he had kingdom authority huh and so he could stand before the greatest person in, in that land the governor Pontius Pilate and saying you only have authority because my father gave you that authority otherwise you got no authority you don't have authority. whatever decision you make I want you to know it's because my father allowed you to make that decision all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth at the end of the day amen so now we have kingdom authority then C, of course, is judgment. Now again, this is not judgment, your judgment and my judgment. He has been judged. Listen, man. We don't have to have God read out our sins. When we came to Jesus, he didn't tell us, all right, you guys are sinners. Let's start. When did you start sinning? When I was two years old, I lied to my father. <laughs> you got to write down. Huh? 
You don't know all your sins and you don't care. So you just confess that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. If we confess that we are sinners and we need His help, then, then as time goes by, Father, I'm sorry, I really messed up, I sinned. Forgive me, cleanse me. Now you, you judge yourself. When you come to the table, it says let every person judge themselves so that they will not be judged. So don't worry about, you know, one day we're going to stand and then we, God is going to hold us accountable for every wrong word that we say. How many of you know that scripture? <laughs> How many of us have said wrong words? <laughs> God or not? Okay, la, maybe not y'all. I, I have to pray. Pray for me. <laughs> so the judgment is not a personal judgment like we, we thought it was. So we lived under the fear that God is going to judge us. He's not. You are his children. Okay, Romans chapter 8 verse uh, 1 says what? There is therefore no condemnation. Now remember, this is a law book. A law book and law language. Right? You are accused by the enemy. Okay? And then you come into the courts and you have to plead guilty or not guilty. Now the enemy knows you are guilty, so you plead guilty. Now the court case begins. You are convicted that you have done wrong. Guilty as charged. So Jesus now becomes our advocate and he fights. There is therefore, finally the judge commends or condemns. Right? He either says free or jail. So when we stand in the courts of God, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Qualification. I am in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, verses 1, verse 2, has made me free from the law of sin and death. Come on. So the Spirit's law makes me free from the law of sin and of death. I am now a free person. Come on. Amen? That's what Romans chapter 8, verses 1, verse 2 says. Okay. So the Spirit of God is the one that changes everything. Now look at the judgment that he's talking about. John chapter 16. Just to prove to you that the judgment is not for believers. Judgment, the certainty of it, because the ruler of this world has been judged. So what's he saying? He's just saying to us, listen, the judgment has taken place. The enemy has been judged. Now at that point, not yet. He will convince you or convict you of the judgment that's about to take place. That the enemy has been defeated. His works have been destroyed. The ruler of this world does not have authority over you anymore. Who does that work? The Holy Spirit. And that's why you have songs like, I am free. I'm a child of God. No longer a, child, a, 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 a spirit of fear. I'm no longer, you know, whatever we sing. All freedom, all liberty. How does that happen? Now, the Holy Spirit convicts us, convinces us that the enemy has already got no more power over us. Who is the ruler of this world? Another scripture. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. Look at this. Uh, judgment of this world. Now, the ruler of this world is driven out. Again, ruler of this world. Huh? Chapter 14, verse 30. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has found nothing in me. So, everybody okay with that one? So the judgment is on the ruler of the world. Okay, let me go very quickly. I'm going to try and close this one. The next two more points. Huh? Second point. The Holy Spirit, first of all, is your friend. Correct? Number two. The Holy Spirit is wonderful, not weird. Not what? Weird. W-E-I-R-D. Why do I say that? Because in Pentecostal circles, they, they, you see, okay, let, let me put it this way. At, at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, 3,000 got saved. People spoke in other languages, uh, prophesied, sons and daughters prophesying. Peter spoke a powerful message. It was a very simple message, but when he spoke... 3,000 were saved. Chapter, chapter 2. Chapter 3. They go down to the temple. A man is healed. At the gate beautiful. 4,000. 5,000 more added to the church. 
Okay? So, thousands are being added. Wonderful results. People are afraid. Ananias and Sapphira come in. They lie against the Spirit of God. They are struck down. Okay? And fear comes upon everybody. And more are added into the church. Nothing weird. Very powerful. And then finally, the final result is, these men who have turned the world upside down have come to us. They turned the world upside down. At the turn of the 20th century, as we enter into the 20th century, now we are 21st century, okay? 21st, uh, 20th century, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Then things began to go down. Why? Because the enemy knew that if there's another outpouring of the Holy Spirit, huh, things will begin to escalate. So what did he do? He brought in a little bit of confusion. He brought in different things that came in. So what happened was the entire movement focused on one gift, the gift of tongues, and on certain individuals. And when man is given total power with zero accountability, man begins to fall. So weird things began to happen. Prophecies began to happen that were weird. People began to do all kinds of crazy things. Now, why, why, uh, did, what, what happened? He tried to make sure that people would become, uh, would become afraid of the Pentecostal movement. All right? That's the whole idea. So he began to sh uh, bring in a lot of weird things into the Pentecostal church, weird happenings in the Pentecostal church. When I first got saved, I attended... Uh, this church, and uh, I'm not knocking this down, or I'm just saying, enter the church. I come out of a hippie kind of a background, okay? Everything is different, huh? Long hair, like music, rock music, the songs, the things we did, different. You come into a Pentecostal church, and you are like back in, <laughs> in, in like you went into a time tunnel kind of thing, and you're thrown back into time where everybody, the hairstyles were weird, okay? The, the ladies all the same, like the pastor's wife's hairstyle, like a German kind of helmet. Like none of them wore makeup. So my conclusion was, I will never marry, never get married, or if I do get married, I'll marry an ugly lady. <laughs> all right? says, because nobody believed and, and the behavior and everything was weird compared to where I was coming from. And this weirdness is the thing that causes people to stay away from the move or Pentecostal or charismatic churches. Now you find all kinds of things on YouTube. Or people are sending out things about coronavirus and prophesying about coronavirus and having, you know, even, even the pastor's fellowship, they sent something out in the pastor's fellowship in Shalom. And so I wrote back and said, uh, this is subjective. I hope you do not mind if I disagree with this. I mean, weird, weird stuff. How people are sitting in the council of God and getting instruction on how to deal with coronavirus. Uh, people are prophesying. Weird things are happening. And so people laugh. They make fun of the Holy Spirit. You, you're following with me or not? So, but the Holy Spirit is a wonderful person. Now, one of the main things is, I've shared this with you before, is reaction and manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Okay? You've heard me use this illustration. If I take the light bulb up and put my finger inside, what you will see is reaction to electricity. If you are a quiet person, you just go, and then drop dead. If you're a noisy person, you scream and yell and yell and yell and scream. It's reacting to a power that you never had run into your body before. Now, this is electric power. The Holy Spirit's power is even greater. So when people see a reaction to the Holy Spirit, people falling on the ground, people screaming out loudly, jumping up and down, those are reactions to the Holy Spirit, not necessarily a manifestation. Because the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is nice. You know why the charismatic movement spread all over the world? It started with a man by the name of David Duplantis. David Duplantis. He was a South African. Smith Wigglesworth prophesied over him and said God's going to use him to bring about an outpouring. He was once invited 
on a talk show on TV. And they said, we understand that you are, you know, spirit-filled and you speak in this thing that they call tongues and all that. He says, yes. He says, it's a language that God has given to us. They said, can you demonstrate to us on TV what's it like to sp this speaking in tongues? Because they thought you get into a trance. So he said, sure, let me just pray. So he prayed very gently in tongues, very gently. And people from all denominations saw that it was not a weird thing. So denominations that were mainline denominations opened. So they, he, he used to wear a badge. He's already gone on to be with the Lord. They called him Mr. Pentecost because he brought about an understanding that the Holy Spirit is actually wonderful, nice, good. He's your friend. He's not weird. So when we see weird things happening, don't get uh, angry with them because some people just don't know how to respond. If we, we always must say this. These things are subjective, which means if you say the Holy Spirit took you up and you went to heaven and God said all these things to you, that's your experience. It doesn't mean I have to accept it. And if it is not in line with the gospel that Paul preached, Paul always says this three times, he writes in different letters, by the gospel, by my gospel. If it is not in line with the gospel that Paul preached, I'm not inclined to, I'm not uh, forced to accept it. Everybody okay? All right, so the Holy Spirit is wonderful. Uh, so the evidences, of course, we say is tongue, but actually the evidences could be more, it could be the uh, evidence is power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's evidence, yeah. Evidence is also uh, love. First Corinthians, you got the gifts, chapter 12, you got the gifts of all the gifts. Chapter 14, speaking in tongues and prophesying. In between, he says, the greatest thing is love. What's the point of you having all these things? So the evidence of a spiritual believer is love. And of course, you know, the evidence of the Holy Spirit is being with us is that there are gifts in operation. And of course, the fruit of the Spirit is in operation. These are evidences. Okay, last of all. Okay, today I'm going a little bit longer, but it's okay. Still didn't finish my time yet. The Holy Spirit is your God. The Holy Spirit is your God. Now, throughout Scripture, you can find all three together. So I've given you some Scriptures there. John 14, verse 15. I, Jesus, will pray the Father and He will give you another helper. Right? All three involved. John 14, 26. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Come on, amen? John 15, 26 in your notes. When the helper comes, whom I will send from the Father. So you have all three included. Like I said, the name of the Holy Spirit is not the Holy Spirit. God does not need a name. He does not need the name Father. He does not need the name Jehovah. He is God. God is one, three in one. So you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Okay? But His name is not the Holy Spirit. He is God. Okay? Everybody okay with that one? He is God. He is my God. So uh, uh, the blessing that I give you, Besides the priestly blessing, the Aaronic blessing, I also conclude by 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean? That Jesus Christ is the author of grace towards us. Yes? The love of God our Father. Father is, God is love. He's the author, the producer of love. And the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Yes or not? So you have all three in the blessing. He is included in the Godhead. He is God. And he is the producer of communion with him, with Christ, with the Father, and with each other. Some translations mistranslate it and they say, and the communion that we have together is through the Holy Spirit. No, no, no. It has nothing to do with us communing. It has to do with the same grace of Jesus, love of God the Father. Then you cannot suddenly change it and say, now it is us. It has to be right translation, right, right understanding, interpretation of Scripture. All three refer to God. He is the author of all three. The author of grace, the author, Jesus Christ, John chapter 1, I think it's verse 14 or 
full of grace and truth. No one has seen God at any time. Jesus Christ came to reveal him. Full of grace, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. So Jesus is the grace person. The Father is the love person. Like I shared last week, God created mankind after the blueprint of heaven. So you have the Father, you have the Son, and you have the Mother. The comforter, the one who brings order. Okay, he's not feminine, but he is the one who does all these things. So he's left in earth for until Jesus returns again, making sure that everything is all right until we return back to the Father. So he's called the comforter, strong comforter, organized comforter, disciplined comforter. Yes, and yet our friend, our helper. Wants to help us. Come on, amen. This, this is more of an Asian kind of a context. Because if you look at the Asian families, you will always find that the mother is sitting down doing homework with the children. Mother is driving them to tuition. Mother is making sure that their rooms are clean. Mother is doing... <laughs> okay? So, so, so the context is that. Remember, the Bible is an Asian book. Written under Asian culture kind of thing. People from Asian things. So that we can understand what is happening. Okay? Now, conclusion with the last one. Now, listen, uh, the fact that, that uh, he is God, here's another scripture, the most positive proof is this one. Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. Peter says to Ananias, Ananias, why have Satan uh, filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have that one? You have that in your notes, right? Then at the end he ends, you have not lied to man, but to God. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to man, but you have lied to God. So the Holy Spirit is God. Come on, amen. Hmm? He's not just a power that God sends and if we want, we give heavy and we don't want. He's the only one sent. If Jesus were here, if we were living in Jesus' time, we would have Jesus. Now Jesus has gone. So what do we have? We have the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is given by uh, a concise commentary on, on the Holy Spirit. And I like this, so I wrote it all down for you. The Holy Spirit intercedes through us on earth. The Holy Spirit calls and qualifies His minister for their work. The Holy Spirit makes us overseers over the flock. The Holy Spirit hears, speaks, teaches, and guides us into all truth. He glorifies Christ and brings all of Christ's words to our remembrance. Now, all this, I'm sure you know, is backed up by Scripture, right? You know that all this is the word that I'm taking out from. He shows us all things and reveals all things. Where he is there, there is liberty. Where he is, there is liberty. The writers of the Bible spoke as they were moved upon by him. We are warned not to grieve him or quench him. Unless a man is born by the Holy Spirit, he cannot perceive or enter the kingdom of God. We are convicted by Him, born again by Him, led by Him, filled with Him, and sealed for all eternity by Him. So we know that is a very important thing for you to keep. Keep that. Keep that. Go through it again and again. So you understand that this is what He's doing right now. Let me just close with this illustration. You know, talking about the gifts of the Spirit, uh, there was this man of God, and I was just uh, listening to a testimony, and an old man of God, and he was sitting on the platform. He was a guest speaker. And uh, in a certain church, and he was sitting there, and then the Holy Spirit gave him a word for a lady who was sitting down in the front. So when it came time for him to speak, he, he was struggling with it, and then, you know, he, he said, then I stood up, and I said, lady, I've got a word for you. Would you stand? Then he asked her this question. He said, uh, lady, do you think God knows? He said, no, he said, God asked me, do you know this woman's past? So he said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and asked me, do I know your past? The moment he said that, the woman put her head down in shame. Then he said, then I said to the Holy Spirit, no, I don't know her past. And he said, I heard it so clearly. This is what the Holy Spirit said. Hmm. Exactly like this. He said, hmm. Neither do I. Neither do I. And it reinforced the fact that God had literally 
forgiven and chosen to forget. Neither do I. And he said it was so powerful when it happened. So the woman suddenly just broke and realized that God had, you know, because she thought, well, now he's going to reveal everything about me. Hmm. Neither do I. Neither do I. The word was neither do I. And he said it was a shocking statement to him. Isn't that God good? Amen. So that's, that's what the Holy Spirit comes to do. He's here to help us. He's on our side. From the beginning of time, God has always been on the side of man. When man fell, God has always been on our side. So the Holy Spirit is always here to help us, not to condemn us, not to push us away, but to help us. Can I hear an amen? All right. Anybody with any questions? Finished on the dot. No questions? Yes.